It was an era where saving each penny to fix up a junker into your own Hot Wheels car was every teen fantasy. Iconic movie and TV cars motivated that drive to create your ultimate dream machine. I'm Victor and straight out of the gen experience, the wickedest rides to grace the big and small screens. Cars that weren't just set dressings, but a character themselves, inspiring us with visions of cruising the highway while heads turned, attracting all the right attention. Hell bent on having a car the minute we got our license, these memorable wheels awoke our need for speed. Not just iconic, but badass rides we covet even today. Now shift into high gear by clicking like and subscribe so I can show you the unforgettable cars that kicked ass from the gen experience. How can you kick off badass rides and not start with the Cannonball Run? As the movie highlights some of the most gorgeous racers on four wheels, it's orgasmic for any car lover out there. From a Rolls-Royce Shadow to a Chevy Monte Carlo and a Subaru Leone to a Dodge Tradesman Ambulance, some of the cars in the movie we will cover in this episode, so you can understand why every boy and every girl looked longingly at the gorgeous designs and addictive speed found in these hot numbers. Speaking of hot, and I am talking about the cars now, we're looking specifically at the 1980 Lamborghini Countach from the first Cannonball Run movie. Sharp and aggressive like the leather-clad lady drivers, Tara Buckman and Adrian Barboa, the Lamborghini design with scissor doors and a center engine helped cement it into our subconscious and also reinforced how women can use some nifty tricks to get out of a ticket. Well, most of the time. Back then, it would have put you back 62 plus thousand dollars compared to today's 2.6 million. Before doing reverse mortgage commercials, our mustache macho man Tom Selleck drove some viewers a flutter, my mother included, while others loved him driving Robin 1, the Ferrari 308 GT3 from Magnum PI, the original from 1980 to 88. It was Magnum's ride of choice from many available to him through his boss Robin Masters on the gorgeous Hawaiian estate. Elegant sportiness and a sleek sunken profile, complete with prancing horse on the hood, the car is a starring role showcasing the beauty, speed, and appeal that attracted the heart of young and old. The vibrant red color and the confidence from a hulk of masculinity in short shorts stepping out made this car an unforgettable experience on screen and just made owning one all more desirable. Magnum's Ferrari was first a 1979 model, then 81, and finally in 84 throughout the series. Driven at the end of the first film and the start of The Road Warrior, Max Rokitansky uses the last V8 in a hopeless war. Screaming down abandoned highways in a post-apocalyptic wasteland, Max's 1970s Ford Falcon X2 Coupe with 600 horsepower is just another of the movie's stars, as it beats down and gets beat up in violent encounters and high-speed chases with the baddies. The silhouette of the sexy police interceptor had many teens hoping to get their own, even a fixer-upper of the Pursuit Special, in pursuit of their own action, if you know what I mean. The first two seasons of Miami Vice featured a Ferrari 365 Daytona Spider. Not authentic, this replica was made of a Corvette 3 chassis and this kit pissed off Ferrari. In response to a lawsuit and in a show of faith, the producers of this South Florida cop action drama destroyed those cars in a fiery season 3 opener. Or did they? There are rumors. Either way, Ferrari had a change of heart with this popular show and replaced Crockett's first set of wheels with two mint condition 1986 Ferrari Testarossas for the remainder of the show's run. Debuting in Paris in 1984, the Testarossa's rear mid-engine design increased stability and improved the car's cornering ability, perfect for those chase sequences while linen jackets and pants flutter in the breeze. The car driven by Don Johnson's character was as popular and sought after as were the men's fashion trends of rolled sleeves on a white blazer over pastel tank tops made famous by this winner of the ratings. Most people are aware of the history of the DeLorean and its rarity, but we never tire of a surprise appearance of this car when we see it in the wild. I used to see it at work fairly often myself. Unfortunately, it was not fitted for time travel, but the angular futuristic design kept all of us dreaming. With gullwing opening car doors, the fantasy of having wheels even remotely close to as cool as this was just as discussed while exiting the theater as the incredible movie itself. The way I see it, if you're gonna build a time machine into a car, why not do it with some style? Perhaps the stainless steel body of the DeLorean was only a pipe dream for young car heads, but who doesn't remember the first time they reached 88 miles per hour in their own car and cracking a smile of reference to what might have been if only they were equipped with a flux capacitor. The Moon Runners, a movie with brothers, a sexy cousin, The Boar's Nest, and Waylon Jennings were obviously inspirations for the Dukes of Hazard TV show. The next time you see the moon out, ain't everybody asleep. Some folks are working. 
However, what they didn't have was an iconic turbocharged Dodge Charger featured in the series. The Dodge Charger had been in production since 1966, and a 1968 and a 1969 Charger were used as the hero car during the show's run. This is the first car in our show that's given a real name referred to throughout the series. The General Lee is orange with the Confederate flag emblazoned on top, which made sense as it was the South in the 70s. This show was exciting network TV that everybody loved. Ugh, how I miss escapist fun. The Chargers were modified slightly to give it a unique look, and although Chargers were not a problem to get early on, as the car became just as big a star as Bo, Luke, and Daisy, Dodge made it more expensive to acquire. By 1983, the General Lee received hundreds of individual pieces of fan mail and was the highlight of the show, just as it had been on the cartoon spinoff on Saturday morning. Yeah, you heard me right. With its fame, General Lees were built by the production as carefully as a nuclear warhead and adhered to a very strict specification. A lot of tricks, including reusing jump and landing scenes from previous episodes, were used to make filming more cost effective. If you didn't jump slide over your hood or leap into or out of your window emulating the cool factor of the Duke brothers, then most likely you're not part of the Gen experience and you missed out. Speaking of the Gen experience, some of these cars got incremental visibility throughout the era that continued to fuel their popularity. If you couldn't get your hand on the real thing, or until you did, you could find the Testarossa in the Sega video game Outrun. You could also get yourself model kits of your favorites so you could try your hand at putting one together, and then sit, stare, and daydream of the day you rocked your own badass ride. Of course, toy lines got into the business of sexy wheels with official licensed toy cars like Hot Wheels, or the Mego line of Dukes, which included the popular General Lee car for their figures. Transformers loved the Lamborghini, with Sideswipe and Sunstreaker taking on that design, as well as Wild Rider, who was the Ferrari. Now let's get back to the cars dreams are made of, with the rest of our TV movie cars that drove us crazy with Grease Monkey Fever through the 70s and 80s. The 1961 Ferrari 250 GT California. Less than 100 were made. It is true, it was rare. So rare in fact that this 1961 Ferrari 250 GT California Spider whew, was barely used in the film and was not the one that fell to its doom out the plate glass window. No Ferraris were harmed during the making of Ferris Bueller's Day Off. A Jaguar, a Fiat Spider, and a VW Type 3 were cleverly used by the special effects team to convincingly mimic the look they needed to tell that car's side quest in this fun-filled high school 80s adventure. That didn't stop car-hungry moviegoers watching with desperation of one day owning something, anything as beautifully crafted and designed as that co-star in the John Hughes film. Although originally envisioned as a Mercedes, you have to admit the Ferrari was the way to go, even if it was all smoke and mirrors. However, there were several real live close-up shots of the vehicle used when necessary and when no harm could possibly come to it. By now you know that neither off-the-lot cars are used in most films or TV shows, and that many get a little modification for filming necessity or even for customization that tells the story or supports the characters. The famous car in Starsky and Hutch was no different. The story of that TV show would not be complete without the Ford Grand Torino, the muscle car known as the Striped Tomato. Jacked up so the nose was lower and fitted with an aluminum tailpipe tip, the bright red car was finished with a white vector stripe on each side, assuring these Hot Wheels became as famous as the human cops in Bay City, California. 1974 through 1976 Torinos were used for the show and began a love affair with cars for millions of teens that was awakened after seeing only one episode of this iconic buddy action drama. The slick ride was not only sexy, but also tough at the same time. The show needed a car like that, and today, people still want a car like this. Along with their action dolls, Mego produced the only car you'll ever need in the series. Adding it to your collection kept you satisfied until you got one of your own. If that's the case, you might be still holding on to that toy car. The General Lee is not the only car given a name for the characters to call it. However, in The Spy Who Loved Me, the name of the 1977 Lotus Esprit S1 is not as formidable as the Charger. The Wet Nelly is a gorgeous car and is a secret designed by MI6. That doesn't mean that the KGB didn't steal the plans and knows all about it in this 1977 James Bond film. Can you swim? The Aston Martin might be Bond's preferred mode of transportation throughout the film series, and the various models might be sought after. We chose this movie and its newer model of sports car not only for how it turned heads, but how it turned into a submarine, only making the Lotus from the film even more badass. But after learning that this sub mode was not standard, you just might have to settle with the sharp wedge styling of this sports car. 
I know you've been waiting for this one and you know we weren't going to skip Kit, the Knight Industries 2000, a modified 1982 Pontiac Firebird Trans Am. Of course, with serious upgrades for an action-packed drama TV series, Kit's sleek black finish and luxurious interiors drove boys wild with desire to be their very own Knight Rider. The Trans Am wasn't as far-fetched to acquire compared to the likes of the Lamborghini. I saw quite a few teens driving used Trans Ams and working on them throughout high school. They had wheels, it was a Firebird, and they didn't care about the sanded down colors or mismatched door panels they sported while they built perfection in their garage. They were making grease lightning and we were all envious. Now if they could only figure out that turbo boost button for launches over ravines and slow traffic. Kit's enemy might have been Carr, but his older brother from the same mother was the 1976 Firebird Trans Am co-star to Burt Reynolds in Smokey and the Bandit. Perhaps more down to earth without its pulsating red eye moving side to side, this classic car was just as desirable. When watching these classic films of this incredible generation and the TV shows that define so many of us, it reminds me of a time when my schoolmates were aching for not only their license, but a set of wheels to drive to school. Their life revolved heavily around getting their hands on a car. Every dollar they made in their high school job was put to working on that car in their driveway each weekend. No matter the condition, if it was drivable, the rest of us were jealous. Ultimately, they had the ride and the rest of us had the bus. But the story of getting a junker to transform into your wheels of freedom is not a common story these days, and certainly wasn't how Joel got his car in 1983. Joey riding in his dad's Porsche 928, the sexual exploits of a high school senior during his parents' vacation just keeps getting him in deeper and deeper. A Porsche was a long shot for any kid to own, even when under $10,000 back in 1979, the year of the car in Risky Business. It was the 80s and those 70s cars were the real deal. Nobody wanted the new cars coming off the line. But if you're going to fantasize about a hot set of wheels, then why not Tom Cruise's ride? And I'm not talking about the prostitute he hires, who then accidentally causes the car to end up falling off a pier into Lake Michigan. Let's hope if you're planning to get a modern Porsche, starting a brothel in your home to pay the eighty dollars to $90,000 it costs today will not be your method of payment. We started with some women. Let's end our TV and movie badass rides with the poster child of 1976, Farrah Fawcett. Simply by driving the 76 Ford Mustang Cobra II as Jill Monroe in the first season of Charlie's Angels before handing it off to a replacement Cheryl Ladd was enough to keep the Mustang in production. Ford was not doing well and the Cobra was not a great car. Worse yet was Jill's fellow angel, Sabrina, who drove a Ford Pinto in the series, a car known to spontaneously explode. Ford may have been financing the series, but I feel like Charlie wanted his girls to end up as real angels. In the last two seasons, GM offered their vehicles as product placement in this TNA television hit. The latter half of these hot cars were immortalized in various styles with Matchbox and Hot Wheels, plus radio-controlled toys and model kits. Even the Bond Lotus may have been the inspiration to The Shark, a vehicle driven by Gloria Baker of the Mass Cartoon. Although technically a Porsche, its aquatic transformation is far too familiar to be a coincidence. Transformers kept up their auto illusion with Wind Charger, the Trans Am. Well, at least I think it's supposed to be a Trans Am. Deformed, it's not nearly as hot as Bandits or Michael Knight's. There are many other incredible vehicles branded into pop culture from TV and movies. However, this was not about iconic cars like the Ecto-1 or A-Team's van. These had to be what I consider both iconic and simply badass. I know I won't get off easy without naming some others that might be your favorites, but didn't make the deep dive. Famous cars like the 1960 Chevy Riptide Corvette Convertible from the detective comedy drama Riptide, 1957's Ford Thunderbird Convertible from the early 80s Vegas TV show, Rockford Files 78 Gold Pontiac Firebird driven by James Garner, Fall Guys 1981 GMC K2500 truck driven by the once bionic but still not easy to break Lee Majors as Colt Seavers, Hardcastle and McCormick's Cody Coyote concept car based on the McLaren M6 GT, Kojak's practical but still sleek Buick Century, the Pontiac 1971 Le Mans commandeered by Popeye Doyle in the French Connection, and the Highland Green 1968 Ford Mustang GT from Bullet. A generation long for the freedom afforded them when they finally get behind the wheel. And when they do, it was going to be a powerful, sexy, classic, tough car they first saw on the screen. Any one of these would make a gearhead desperate to get their hands on. Which was your first love? The one you hoped, wished, and prayed to get when you finally passed that driver's test. I didn't see any iconic, awesome challengers on the list, which is too bad since that's the ride of my choice today. 
Let me know your memories of seeing these cars, working on these cars, and finally getting one and cruising the roadways, showing off your smooth moves and cool car attitude. Thanks for clicking like and hopefully you subscribed as well. The Gen Experience store is now open, so please feel free to browse. Check out the channel for more great content provided us all by the Gen Experience. Until next time. Come on, guys, let's get to work. Yeah.